Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to U.S. History Through Film. Today, we'll be learning about the Declaration of Independence through the musical film 1776. Now, when the First Continental Congress met uh, late in 1774, they did seem a bit radical to some Americans. But many American colonists um, were worried about what was happening um, in their colonies. Massachusetts in particular seemed to be losing many of its valuable rights. The British government was increasingly um, intrusive and abusive, and many colonists worried the same thing might happen to them wherever they might be. And so the boycotts of British goods proposed by Congress were mostly followed, um, and militia units began to train seriously, um, and the British responded disastrously. In Massachusetts, the military governor, General Thomas Gage, heard that gunpowder was being stockpiled by the militia in Lexington and in Concord, not too far um, from Boston. Furthermore, in Lexington, those leading sons of liberty, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, were believed to be in hiding with some of their important paperwork. And so, Gage made plans to capture these men and these supplies. And he drew upon the best soldiers in each of his regiments. At this point, most regiments in the British Army uh, had a number of companies of regular soldiers, but also uh, a company of grenadiers, soldiers chosen for their height and strength, and trained to be shock troops to overwhelm the enemy um, with their sheer physical power. Also, after the French and Indian War, uh, many British regiments had a company of light infantry meant to serve as scouts and skirmishers um, who could fight somewhat irregular warfare, not um, just fighting in a line and firing in volleys, as had not always worked out that well during the French and Indian War. Um, both these types of companies were viewed as elite units, and Gage picked the light infantry and the grenadiers um, from each of his regiments, but this meant that these different companies were not used to working together very well, and he'd often viewed each other somewhat as rivals, and that would not help his operations um, on, uh, on April 18th and 19th, uh, 1775. Certain colonists heard of General Gage's plan, and so they went out along the uh, projected British route to warn the towns um, and villages along the way. The three men to make this midnight ride were Paul Revere, William Dawes, and Dr. Samuel Prescott, all leading sons of liberty in Boston. Although, in fact, while it's known as Paul Revere's ride, um, he did not complete the ride. All three men were captured by the British and questioned. While they all escaped, only Dr. Prescott made it all the way to Concord. Along the way, they warned the militia, including the Minutemen, in militia who claimed they could fight at a minute's notice. And so, when the British arrived in Lexington, the local militia were waiting for them on Lexington Green. The British ordered them to disperse, um, but as they began to head back home, the British fired on them anyway, because they told them not only to go home, but to drop their weapons as well, which of course they did not do. Um, eight Minutemen were killed and ten were wounded. Some did fire back, and one British soldier was wounded as well in the first battle of the Revolutionary War. From there, the regulars proceeded to Concord, where they faced more determined opposition across a little bridge over the river there. And as the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson would put it decades later, there the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. And the British did, ma did manage to destroy a few military supplies in Concord, um, but not nearly as much as they had hoped and then began to head back to Boston. And here is where things really went wrong for the British. As they marched down the road um, in their straight disciplined lines, they were fired upon the whole way back by militiamen hiding behind trees and fences and buildings and unable to really respond. 174 regulars were wounded, 73 killed, and 26 went missing. And once they returned to Boston, they were trapped in the city. And a siege began with New England militia surrounding Boston and Gage's men trapped within. And as the siege entered its second month in May of 1775, the Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia 
This time, delegates eventually arrived from all 13 colonies. And this group um, would lead the United States for the majority of the Revolutionary War. Now, um, some delegates to Congress came ready to demand independence. And from Massachusetts, um, John and Samuel Adams um, wanted full independence from Britain, as did John Hancock. Likewise, a number of Virginians were eager for independence. Richard Henry Lee, for example, and Patrick Henry, um, as well as George Washington. Um, on the other hand, there were many um, who did not think we had to go that far. Patrick Henry may have said, give me liberty or give me death, um, just two months earlier, in March of 1775. Again, there were those who still hoped peace and reconciliation were possible. Of those, one of the most notable was John Dickinson of Pennsylvania, a very firm critic of British policy, but still wanting to remain British. And again, representing Quakers in Pennsylvania, um, he wanted to avoid armed conflict. But in terms of armed conflict, no one was more ready than George Washington. And this delegate from Virginia was ready for independence and was ready to fight for it. Indeed, he showed up in his military uniform as one of the few members of Congress with military experience, being a veteran of the French and Indian War, uh, and at least according to John Adams, because he was the tallest man in the room, Washington was named the commander of military forces around Boston. He went to Boston um, and named his forces there the Continental Army. Another reason he may have been chosen was because as a Virginian, um, this would help to bring the South into the conflict. Indeed, Virginia was already one of the few colonies from outside New England that had sent significant numbers of men um, to assist in the siege of Boston. But when Washington designed a flag for the Continental Army, what he called the Continental Colors, it still contained the British Union flag in the upper corner. 13 stripes for the 13 colonies, but still British colonies. Even now, with fighting going on, Congress and most American colonists wanted to remain part of the British Empire. Now, over the course of the war, Congress was made up of varying numbers of delegates from each of the colonies. But it did not matter how many people were present from any given colony or later state, as each state got one vote, regardless of its size or wealth. Um, if there were multiple delegates from one colony or state, they would have a little vote amongst themselves to decide how to cast their state's vote. Congress did have a president, but he was basically a chairman running debates and supervising the meetings. He wasn't really an important figure in his own right, not an executive president, um, as we think of today. Um, now, John Dickinson of Pennsylvania composed a letter from Congress to the king, known as the Olive Branch Petition, expressing that the colonies still were loyal to the king, asking the king, in his role as protector of his people, to call for a ceasefire until some solution could be found. But before the petition could arrive, in August of 1775, King George III, declared the colonies to be in rebellion and outside his protection. So any further action by the colonists would be treason, punishable by death. Furthermore, in September of 1775, while the Olive Branch Petition was still on its long, slow way across the Atlantic Ocean, King George began hiring mercenaries um, from Germany. Um, Germany in those days was not a united country, but a number of small German-speaking um, countries um, in Central Europe. And many of the mercenaries were hired from two different countries called Hesse. And so these mercenaries were referred to in general as Hessians by Americans, even though that's slightly misleading. Some were from other parts of Germany and elsewhere too. But the key thing, was these were foreign mercenaries, renowned for their professionalism and their cruelty. And from the point of view of the colonists, here was the king, to whom they had always professed loyalty, bringing foreign forces 
into what they had thought was a domestic matter. Finally, in November, the Olive Branch petition arrived um, in London, um, or pardon me, um, it arrived before that. But in November, word got back to um, America that the Olive Branch petition had arrived in London, but that King George had refused to even read it. Um, it seemed like the last chance for peace was gone. And then, in January of 1776, Thomas Paine, who had recently moved to America from England, published a short book, or a thick pamphlet, entitled Common Sense, um, written in a way that anyone could understand. Most colonial leaders um, at that time had a pretty good education, um, and they wanted to show it off. They would quote from or allude to or refer to um, famous writers. Um, some would quote in Latin or even ancient Greek. And, you know, that was certainly impressive to the kind of people who had similar types of education. But for many Americans, it did not have, you know, quite the same impact as the plain language the, um, presenting the argument in common sense terms that Paine was able to put together. Um, he asked, for example, if it was sensible that a continent should be ruled by an island. And the book argued um, for a complete break with England, even if it required violence to accomplish it, and has convinced many, many Americans that independence was necessary. Indeed, within a few months, 120,000 copies had been sold, making it the best-selling publication in the colonies that year. And during this time, fighting continued in 1775 into 1776. Now, around Boston, there was only one major battle, known as Bunker Hill, although in fact it was fought mainly on a hill near Bunker Hill called Breed's Hill, um, but it was recorded wrong early on. We've stuck with it. The Battle of Bunker Hill um, was an attempt by the British to break out of Boston um, and the colonists to stop them by defending Breed's Hill. Digging in to defend the hill, the British charged repeatedly at the hill and were mown down. The colonists in the held their fire as the British approached, their commander famously saying, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. Then when they got close, mowed them down. American forces eventually surrendered, but only after they'd run out of gunpowder. The British technically won, but such a terrible loss of life they never actually tried to break out of Boston again. Um, there was fighting elsewhere. Um, at the, the fortress of Ticonderoga, um, which the British had captured from the French during the French and Indian War, eventually, the British had um, an important garrison and lots and lots of heavy cannons. But they weren't paying attention. And American forces, primarily the Green Mountain Boys from Vermont, um, caught the guards there by surprise in the middle of the night, seized it without a fight. And, it, um, and along with the Green Mountain Boys, led by Ethan Allen, was Benedict Arnold, uh, an American officer who played a key role in this big victory, but wasn't really appreciated or recognized for it. Um, one of many things that would make him bitter towards the American cause as time passed. The cannons seized at Ticonderoga were hauled back to Boston. Um, under the command of General Henry Knox, um, who previously had owned a bookstore in Boston, but in his spare time had read books on military strategy. They eventually set the cannons up around Boston um, and um, offered the British the chance to leave the city. When they refused, the cannons began to fire into the city on March 3rd, 1776. March 9th, um, a ceasefire was agreed to, and March 17th, almost exactly 11 months after the battles of Lexington and Concord, the British evacuated the city, along with hundreds of local loyalists. Um, and March 17th is still officially celebrated as Evacuation Day in Boston, although it's rather overshadowed today um, by the uh, St. Patrick's Day celebrations. So, in the spring and early summer of 1776, a number of towns and counties and even entire colonies began to issue their own local declarations of independence or sent instructions to their delegates in Congress 
um, to begin working for independence. So with the Olive Branch petition rejected, fighting continuing, and people increasingly fired up by Thomas Paine's common sense, Congress finally decided to declare independence after independence was officially proposed by the Virginian Richard Henry Lee. They chose a committee of five men to draft a formal declaration. and were John Adams of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin, famous scientist and writer and inventor. Roger Sherman was a delegate from Connecticut, and although he did not play a big role in writing the Declaration of Independence, he would play a very important role in creating the U.S. Constitution some years later. Robert Livingston was a delegate from New York, again on the Declaration Committee, but not particularly influential on it. Of course, the writing was really done by Thomas Jefferson, delegate from Virginia. And the Declaration of Independence is a statement of purpose. Um, there are four main sections of the Declaration of Independence. First is a, a short section explaining why it is necessary to issue a declaration, admitting that declaring independence um, is a very unusual and risky thing to do, and that they owe it to the world to explain why they are doing it. The second section is the most famous section, describing the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, um, and promising to prove that the British, and specifically the King of Britain, were violating those rights. The third, and by far the longest, section of the Declaration of Independence is a list of complaints against the King. And up to this point, the colonists had always, at least in public, insisted they were loyal to the King. Their complaints were against members of Parliament, against the king's advisors, against various royal officials, but they were loyal always, they said, to the king himself. But now they would demonstrate that the king was a tyrant to whom they owed no more loyalty. And finally, a resolution at the end, concluding that the colonies were, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. And the signers agreed to support the declaration, with their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. All this based on the idea of a social contract and the rule of law, the idea that governments must work for the public good, not just the private interests of, uh, of members of the government. Indeed, the government must protect its people and their rights, and if it doesn't, then it no longer deserves their loyalty. It is their right. It is their duty to throw off such a government. Now, the Declaration of Independence, as written by Mr. Jefferson, um, had some parts that were controversial. There was a period of debate. Um, to make sure all the grievances listed expressed all the infringements on the various colonies' liberty, he removed a few things, too. The most controversial complaint against King George III was that he had waged cruel war against human nature itself by supporting the slave trade, carrying people from Africa to the New World. Um, delegates from South Carolina and Georgia insisted on removing this criticism of the king. Um, and some people saw this as hypocritical. The great English writer um, Samuel Johnson said, why do we hear the loudest yelps for liberty from the drivers of Negroes? And while Jefferson had wanted to criticize the slave trade, he also criticized the royal governor of Virginia for encouraging existing slaves to rise up um, and attack their masters. So, um, after some modifications, on July 2nd, 1776, Congress agreed to declare independence, and after two days of debate, on July 4th, 1776, independence was officially declared. Although most delegates did not end up signing the document till much later, mostly in August and September, but some even later than that if they happened to be in town. And official doc copies of the Declaration were not sent out to the states until January of 1777, after Washington's army had finally won a few big victories. Um, but 
Most people knew the wording of the Declaration. Indeed, George Washington read a copy of it to the people of New York City as early as July 9, 1776. The people of New York City were inspired to riot. Um, they pulled down a statue of King George III, cut off the statue's head, cut the nose off the statue, put the rest of the head on a pike, uh, and melted the rest of the statue down. The statue was made of lead, and they melted it into musket balls to fire the king's statue at the king's soldiers. And with this National Declaration of Independence, individual states, if they had not already done so, began to issue their declarations of independence. And most began to write new state constitutions as well, because, of course, they no longer could or wanted to depend on the royal charters um, or other forms of colonial government that had come to them from Britain. Still, there were some complaints. Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams, reminded her husband to remember the ladies. She said the Declaration of Independence did not really affect women, because women were not fully citizens. Uh, they were not able to vote. They were largely unable to own property. Um, many other laws restricted them. Under the principle of coverture, a woman, upon marriage, basically became an appendage of her husband. The two became one flesh, as the Bible says, and so her rights and identity merged with his. And, of course, slaves were not getting independence or liberty from America. Um, the revolution would keep them as slaves, although, as I mentioned already, Lord Dunmore, the royal governor of Virginia, offered freedom to any slaves um, who would rise up and fight on behalf of the British. And Thomas Jefferson condemned this in the Declaration of Independence. So, even with greater freedom and more democracy than the world had ever known starting to come into existence, complete liberty and equality were a long way away. Furthermore, not every American supported the Declaration of Independence. Looking back many years later, John Adams estimated um, that a third of Americans had actually been loyal to the king, um, people known as loyalists. Um, a third, he said, were indifferent. Only one third, he said, were true blue. And so this meant the American Revolution, besides, being a war for independence was also a civil war, um, with patriots fighting against loyalists. Those men there in their red uniforms um, are the Royal Americans, a regiment raised in America to support the king. Loyalists were also known as Tories, after the British political party that supported royal authority. Um, and Tories or loyalists often had their homes and property seized or destroyed, Although in areas where Tories were powerful, the same might happen to patriots. Uh, so it was a civil war, um, particularly bad in, in some areas in the South. Um, and of course, before this Declaration of Independence could mean anything, the colonists had to win a war. And the war in mid-1776 did not seem to be going that well. Now, the movie, 1776, was released in 1972 and based on a Broadway musical of the same name, first performed in 1969. Um, and I'll admit, the first time I saw this play at the Barter Theater, um, I had seen a brief description um, in the pamphlet that it was about the American Revolution. Um, the pamphlet either didn't mention or I overlooked that it was a musical. Um, I arrived just a tiny bit late and walked in the theater to find John Adams singing. Um, I'm not sure John Adams ever sang a note in his life. I'll admit I spent most of the play thinking this is kind of stupid. And on the way home, I, was, I found myself humming all the tunes. Um, and I've come to really appreciate it as a, as a movie, and I hope you will too. One interesting thing about it is that most of the actors um, who were in the Broadway production are also in the film version, playing the same characters. The uh, musical, by the way, was popular enough to be performed in the White House for President Nixon. Although when the film version was released, he requested that one song, Cool, Cool, Considerate Men, be removed because he felt it was insulting to conservatives. Um, some of the film footage was saved, though, and they've been able to restore most of it. Um, to uh, 
to the um, to the restored director's cut DVD that we'll get to enjoy. Um, the film was made on sets built in or near Hollywood, but most are pretty realistic. All there is um, a big calendar um, and in uh, on the set and a board that lists how all the colonies stand on the subject of independence. All that, of course, is made up for the movie and the play to make it easy for the audience to follow along. Costumes are decent in terms of historical accuracy, uh, even if not exceptional. A lot of the dialogue is taken from letters and pamphlets and books and other things written by the founding fathers. Although there are several cases where they take one man's words and put them in another man's dialogue for dramatic effect in the play. Furthermore, there were at least 50 delegates to the Second Continental Congress at the time the play is set in June and early July of 1776, but they only show about 30 in the play and movie to keep it from getting too crowded. Um, every colony had more delegates than they actually show in the movie, except Delaware, which actually did have um, the three who were shown. Um, no more and no less. And even some um, who are present will leave for part of the movie um, just to get them out of the way, even if their historical counterparts were there. The whole time. Um, there are enough exciting people during this time period that didn't want some um, taking over the show. And of course, it's done for simplicity's sake. Uh, keeping up with 30 characters is hard enough, let alone. Uh, let alone if there were 50 or more. And several of the characters shown have attitudes a bit different from their historical personalities. Um, there are some who are shown to be very hostile to the idea of independence, who are really not nearly so opposed to it, but are made to be so for dramatic purposes. Um, um, now, and, and a few other attitudes, I think, are, uh, are a little bit artificial as well, mostly to create drama. Now, John Adams um, from Massachusetts is the main character of the play. He describes himself as obnoxious and disliked. Oh, in fact, that's a description he um, came up with for himself many years later when he became old and bitter and cynical. Uh, at the time the Continental Congress met, he was widely liked and influential uh, and and pretty well liked. Yeah, he played a big role in promoting independence and would serve Congress as a diplomat to France and the Netherlands and Britain. In, in the movie, he's kind of a combination of the actual historical John Adams and also his cousin Samuel Adams, who was really in Congress at this point, but who they keep out of the play, um, and for simplicity's sake. Abigail Adams, his wife, remained in Boston um, while Adams served as a a congressional delegate, but the two often wrote to each other, um, and she appears in a few scenes in the movie communicating with her husband. Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania is referred to as Dr. Franklin throughout the movie because he received honorary doctorates um, from St. Andrews University in Scotland and Oxford University in England, recognizing his contributions to science, studying light, electricity, weather, oceanography, and more and bidding things like bifocals, um, the stove, the lightning rod, and many more things. He tried for a very long time to promote um, understanding between Britain and the colonies, um, but finally concluded that was impossible. But he opposed independence for a long time. Um, although by the time the movie is set, um, he has changed his tune. He would later serve alongside John Adams as a diplomat in France, um, and there they would find each other awfully annoying. Their friendship in the movie is largely made up. Um, he, Franklin also served as governor of Pennsylvania, helped to write the U.S. Constitution, um, and um, was probably the most respected and certainly the most famous American in the world. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia a former member of the House of Burgesses with interest in science and architecture and music. He plays the violin. He's depicted in the movie as recently married and desperate to return to his wife. And having just gotten married, um, he'd really like to get some. In fact, um, they'd been married for about four and a half years, although he was desperate to return to her because he was worried about her health. She'd recently suffered a miscarriage um, 
and was uh, in pretty bad shape. Later on, Jefferson would be governor of Virginia, ambassador to France, secretary of state, vice president, and president. John Hancock from Massachusetts serves as president of Congress, although it's largely a ceremonial role um, in which he's kind of a chairman for congressional meetings, but doesn't have much power. Beyond that, he's a prominent member of the Sons of Liberty, one of the richest men in the colonies, thanks to a successful shipping business and possibly smuggling, too. Stephen Hopkins of Rhode Island is a former governor of Rhode Island and a chief justice of the Supreme Court for Rhode Island, and not quite as wild in real life as they depict him in the movie. In the movie, they show him wearing a hat all the time, which is actually significant. Um, he had become a Quaker after marrying um, a woman who was a member of a prominent Quaker family, Quakers being quite common in Rhode Island, that being one of the few states that would tolerate a group um, as radical as they. Quakers believe that because all people are equal in the eyes of God, they should be equal in all other ways, too. Um, so that Quakers treated men and women as equal um, in terms of social behavior. Um, at this time, men removed their hats when they greeted each other. In particular, a man of lower social status removed his hat sooner and kept it off longer um, than someone of higher social status. Quakers refused to do this, saying it was artificial, um, sinful. They called it hat honor um, and never removed their hats to make a point, which sometimes caused fights um, and even lawsuits. Furthermore, when the Quakers um, were formed in the 1600s, English still used thee and thou as an informal way um, to speak to someone else. You was, uh, was a formal term. Um, but Quakers called everyone thee and thou because no one should be treated formally or like a superior. And that too led to outrage by people who felt insulted. So he wears his hat all the time because he's a Quaker. Ian John Dickinson of Pennsylvania is shown as the main opponent of independence. Of course, he had been the author of the Olive Branch Petition, trying to restore peace between Britain and the colonies. Um, in the movie, he doesn't mention um, one of his big objections to independence is because he represented an area full of Quakers. Indeed, his wife was a Quaker. Um, he didn't want to do anything that might pull um, Pennsylvania into a war. Um, on the other hand, um, he was not you know, as, uh, um, as supportive of Britain as suggested. Um, he had criticized British policy quite a bit. He had written of Americans as having a distinctive national character, but he still did not want to reject the British system as a whole. And there are many more characters um, who we'll talk about after the movie is over when we look at the worksheet. Um, however, aside from looking at the worksheet, um, there's not really a follow-up lecture after the movie. Rather, um, we'll move right on to, uh, to our next film after taking a quick look at the worksheet for 1776.